In this PD module, we are looking at how to transform a little miracle in all of our learners. That is to say, we're taking a group of children who are largely operating at the concrete level in both problem solving and in representation. And by the end of the school year, we're hoping to transform them into learners who are mathematically strategic, able to work with numbers flexibly and employ mental strategies for numbers within 20. Furthermore, they need to be able to do this fluently for single digit sums within 10. Likewise, they need to have developed expertise in writing equations for all types of problem situations with unknowns in different positions. And they need to be so experienced with these equations that they can meaningfully use them to solve for unknowns also in different positions. It's a bit frightening and yet exhilarating at the same time. I've chosen to begin this PD module with a topic that at first glance may seem like it has nothing to do with this above task. You may not have even heard of number bonds before. However, if we're going to be successful at transforming our young learners into strategic mathematicians, we need tools that will serve as an effective bridge between their current understanding to more abstract understandings. The number bond is a type of representation that serves as such a tool. We'll be using number bonds often to illustrate relationships and to show how these mathematical relationships can become obvious to children. Number bonds are specifically mentioned by the Common Core writing team in the kindergarten through fifth grade progressions for operations and algebraic thinking. The image you see here is actually taken from the portion of that document that is specifically examining progressions in first grade. As you can see, the authors cite the potential of number bonds to make composing and decomposing actions clear, so students can make sense of the operations. The authors also illustrate that number bonds can be used with concrete representations inside the fields of the number bond as a scaffold to the more abstract representation with numerals. You will see a curricular example of this in just a minute. Number bonds have several advantages. They are less messy than word descriptions. The word descriptions have their advantages in terms of contextualizing, but in order to see mathematical relationships, sometimes we need to decontextualize. And the number bond is very helpful for allowing us to decontextualize the numbers and see what relationships are at work. Initially, at least, they make those relationships clearer than equations do. And they can also be used effectively as a bridge between the concrete understanding and the more formal symbolic writing of equations. We'll also look more clearly at that in a minute. Finally, number bonds can grow with a learner. If this becomes a tool that your school uses across grade levels, there are some really interesting things that you can do with it as the children progress in higher levels. And I'm going to give you one example of that at the end of the lesson. So what exactly are number bonds? Well, they are a visual representation that shows how two parts can make up a third, a whole. So it, or another way of looking at it is how a whole can be partitioned into two or more parts. In one clear visual image, the students can see the relationship that undergirds an entire family of related facts. Initially, then, the focus is on understanding this relationship and understanding it well, as opposed to memorizing a lot of associated facts. Another advantage to this approach is that focusing on the number of relationships, as opposed to learning all of those uh, associated facts, prevents some particular misconceptions from occurring. For example, a child may write down 3 minus 2 equals 5, because they're just mimicking equations with a set of three numbers that go together. When they focused more on memorizing sets of associated facts as opposed to learning how the quantities are related to one another, then those kinds of misconceptions can occur. Now, is that to say that it could never occur with a number bond? No, of course it could if the child is not using it meaningfully. But there's a lot less to memorize, and you can focus on where it makes sense to position the numerals that you are writing in there. And that becomes something that you involve the students in in making decisions. You look for their misconceptions. You engage with them accordingly. Understanding the concept of the number bond will support students when they eventually get to the point where they need to form appropriate numeric equations for a whole variety of situations. And in first grade, students will learn all the number bonds for 1 through 10 and be able to also deal with the associated equations. 
When introducing representations, it's always important to think about what misconceptions might occur or what limitations might result. In this case, I, what I really want students to focus on is the relationship. So I need to have some variety of other features so that the focus becomes on the relationship and not the format. So I want students to comprehend that it isn't necessarily the appearance that's right or wrong. It's the relationship that's right or wrong. So notice all the variation you see here. Sometimes I'm using boxes and sometimes I'm using circles. Sometimes I'm orienting it with the hole on the top, sometimes on one side, sometimes on another side, sometimes on the bottom. These are not things that define the relationship. And the thing that defines the relationship is that both parts connect to the whole because both parts join together form the whole. So that's the part that I really, really want them to comprehend and understand. And by giving them a lot of variation in those other features, they have to keep making sense of where to position things uh, in order for the relationship to be true. And that's what I really want them to be spending their time thinking about, not whether to use a square or a circle or put the hole on the top or the bottom. So variety is important here so that the children focus in on the relationship rather than on arbitrary elements. When introducing the number bonds, expect to start from concrete representations to incrementally more abstract number bond. Now eventually the number bond will become even more abstract as we um, convert it to an equation. Now I'm not just talking about this concrete to abstract progression occurring in one lesson either. It's not like you just introduce it and from now on we can do number bonds. This sort of thing is ongoing. In the early stages of working with the number bonds, the representation should always be grounded in a visual image or a concrete experience. The child makes sense of it in the visual image or the concrete experience, and after they've made sense of it, you are modeling how it can be converted into a number bond. And as soon as possible, you are involving the students in supporting you in developing the number bond, and you are gradually transitioning so that they can create the number bond for themselves. Feel free to model each representation in more than one way. You need at least two ways, but feel free to model it in more than one way. For example, if you're reading a story, and we're going to take a look at one in a minute, if you're reading a story and it has an embedded number bond in the story, you could ask students to point out in the story, especially in some of the pictures and picture books, um, what they see, what they notice, point out the number bond. Then you can act it out with unifix cubes, which is also concrete. And then you can actually write it as a number bond. So that's like three different representations of, of the same idea. One where it's a picture of the actual object, one where it's concrete, but it's not the actual object, and then one where it's the more abstract numerals. Typically, in order to reinforce concepts, students need to experience it through at least two representations, which are at, at slightly different levels of abstraction, starting with the familiar, uh, typically, and then going towards the more abstract. However, I should point out that they need to make connections back and forth. It isn't like do one thing and then do the other. The actual value comes when they try to relate those two representations together and see how are they representing the same relationship. Number bonds then are used to illustrate a number relationship and an additive relationship which describes both addition and subtraction typically involves a whole or total which can be partitioned in two or more parts or add-ins. So here the whole is five and the two parts or add-ins are two and three. This image actually comes from a kindergarten textbook and you'll see how it starts with the actual context and then takes it towards more um, abstraction. The connections are so important though that as you get to the final one you're still asking questions like let's take a look at this three. I see a numeral three. Go back to the picture. What does the numeral three represent? So you're constantly asking them to make connections. What do the red cubes represent here? So do they know it's the adult lions? That's really important for them to make sense of these new representations. They have to keep going back to the familiar. Children's earliest arithmetic strategies involve acting out situations. Here you see a situation that involves three sheep in the barn and two sheep outside of the barn. 
Most first graders do not have to have sheep counters in a barn to act out this problem, but every once in a while you do have a child who has trouble abstracting that cubes could stand for sheep. And so this could be a temporary scaffold if you see a child who just appears to be lost getting started problem solving. Then you might find realistic um, manipulatives are helpful. Kindergarten problem solving often does start with these actual items to facilitate the direct modeling. Keep in mind that cognitive development is fostered by stretching children's familiar strategies to that next level of abstraction. So after they act it out, you can suggest that they use the blocks to tell the same story again. In this way, even though you're still using a concrete material, it's slightly more abstract than the realistic counters. And additionally, you can stretch that relationship even further by modeling how the number bond that matches that situation could be shown. Finally, you can also model how the equation can be written, again involving them as appropriate. Throughout this instructional sequence, your goal is not really on each of the individual components so much as it is on the connection back and forth, being able to point to things and say, how, does that, how is that represented in our original situation, for example? So when they look at the final, 2 plus 3 equals 5, um, what, are, what do each of those components mean? Now that you have an introductory concept for number bonds, we're going to take a look at some ways in which they can be used in first grade, and then even a few examples of how they can be used beyond first grade so that you see their potential as a representation that can actually grow with a child's mathematical development. Number bonds are a useful representation right from the beginning of first grade when most of your learners are still very much at a concrete stage of problem solving. Although you may be eager to move quickly to more advanced strategies and representations, it's important to recognize that there's really some important, um, significant mathematical work that's occurring during this early part of the year. First, children are solidifying their capacity to represent mathematical situations with concrete materials and a whole variety of mathematical situations. This is laying the groundwork for future problem solving because one of the most difficult parts of problem solving is turning words into arithmetic. And so the work that they do with direct modeling is helping to train them for how to mathematize a word situation. They're also building number relationships and improving in their capacity to document and think about these relationships as parts and wholes. Finally, they're learning to write equations for the easiest problem types, which are the result unknown and the total unknown problems. In this picture, you see a child working on an assignment where they're using a concrete representation to complete a number bond and then using the number bond to develop an equation. Your work with number bonds can also lead to some interesting concept discussions. In an article for Teaching Children Mathematics, Lubinsky and Otto describe how the book How Many Snails can be used to help children generate some number relationships which the teacher can then model as equations. So you see that there are eight clouds in this two-page spread from the book How Many Snails. If you examine them by color, you can see that the clouds can be partitioned into four gray clouds and four white clouds. But if you partition them according to size, there are five small clouds and three big clouds. Because the total amount of clouds are the same, children can come to see that the expression 4 plus 4 is equivalent to 5 plus 3, and they can begin to explore the use of the equal sign as showing an equivalence, and that's going to be the topic of our next lesson. The number bond here is used to decontextualize the number relationships that are embedded in a visual image and organize them in a way that will support their transition to writing the equation. Later this week, you'll see how those number bonds can be used to facilitate even some of the more complex equation writing. In addition to exploring concepts of equivalence, number bonds can also be used to explore properties of operations, such as the commutative property, which is evident in this first grade task. The way that they do this is by noticing that the number bond is exactly the same for both of these equations. It's the same relationship. Some problems are harder to act out than others. The problem here is a part-whole problem with a missing part. It is not an action problem, so it is a little harder to, um, to actually act out or to direct model, and it's 
clearly not a takeaway problem, but it is subtraction. So it is confusing for students sometimes to identify it as subtraction, especially if they have the misconception that subtraction and takeaway are the same thing. So if they draw a number bond, it helps them to see that what they know is the total and one of the parts and that they're missing another part. And they can come to see that this is a subtraction situation. We talked about that in module, in part A of the first grade modules. Seeing this relationship then can support the child in recognizing that they need to use subtraction. In first grade number and base 10 domain, children are to learn that they can add within 100 using the idea of adding tens with tens and adding ones with ones and then recomposing the number. You see how their earlier work with number bonds can also be used to facilitate the meaning of the process in such a way that they bring place value into it. Children in second grade, so now we're moving beyond sort of seeing where it will go next. Children in second grade can use number bonds to make sense of mental math strategies. Here, children are taking computational examples that would normally involve regrouping, and they're applying a strategy that allows these problems to be solved easily mentally. However, the strategy would be very difficult to understand and to use if you weren't aware of the mathematical relationship that allows it to happen. So by studying the number bond, it allows you to see more clearly what's actually happening that enables that strategy to be successful. Children beyond second grade can continue to use number bonds to see relationships that they can then leverage with mental strategies. We're going to take a look primarily at the division example that you see off to the right. I think most adults would find it difficult to divide 51 by 3 mentally if you just asked them to do that. If you gave them a moment, they might try to come up with a mental chalkboard, but it wouldn't be very easy. It wouldn't be very comfortable. Here, though, you can see that if you can mentally decompose the number 51 as a, a mental number bond into two parts, 30 and 21, both of which are divisible by 3, then the problem becomes pretty easy. I know that 30, 3 goes into 30 10 times and 3 goes into 21 7 times. It must be 17. Being able to decompose 51 using that kind of number bond format, which you can do in 4th and 5th grade if you've had years of experience with number bonds and decomposing numbers. And you can see how advantageous that can be down the road in the curriculum. If you're interested in trying out the lesson idea involving how many snails,